Hello, everybody. This is the Friendly Bear Podcast, where we interview some of the best and brightest traders in the trading community. Listen to inspiring stories and nuggets of insight from current and future game changers in the trading space. Listen and learn as we explore all types of trading niches with some of the best in the industry from a Friendly Bear point of view. With that being said, I am your host, David, aka Reverse Long, and this is the Friendly Bear Podcast. Let's dive in. What's up, guys? We're here back uh, in LA um, doing the part three of the crypto series. Um, back with Justin. So in part one, um, we uh, got introduced to Justin and his uh, but with your trading community for or you know crypto community, and uh, you know just getting a background, on Justin and and general info. And then part two, uh, Justin was uh, getting me signed up with Binance, uh, getting more in depth with what it takes to get started and what you need to do to get started to get on the crypto journey and um everything you need to know to to start out and now part three we're doing uh, a couple of case studies on a couple of uh tokens is that what they are oh uh, yeah tokens? These, these are technically called tokens um there's a difference between coin and token a uh, coin is actually native to its own blockchain so ethereum would be considered a coin Bitcoin would be considered a coin. Uh, Cardano would be considered a coin. And then a token is actually um, made off of a blockchain. So it's not native to that blockchain. It was created underneath of that blockchain. So uh, most of the most popular tokens are called ERC-20 tokens. So um, yeah, quick, quick breakdown there. Nice. Okay. And uh, but so I've been uh, in like Justin's crypto community of But Would You like with the Zoom um meetings and like you know following him on instagram and twitter and all this because i've been interested in starting out with crypto and his stuff is like really simple to follow really easy and these guys are just really friendly so i got involved with uh, some of the zoom meetings and he went over Jiro wallet in his last one when i was in florida last week and i did it i was looking at the zoom meeting on my phone and I was following it. Was he was so clear, like like he's like he's uh describing how to do everything here. You know, he's just really clear in how he describes things. So like I, it, it was really clear to me and what I know from stocks. Um, this sounded like a really you know really good kind of uh introduction of crypto and how to do like a case study or do do your own research due diligence kind of thing in a really simple way. So I decided to have him introduce it to the podcast. So these two case studies of Jiro Wallet and TRVL, which hasn't come out yet. It's a token. But Jiro Wallet, um, who I saw when he was describing it in the Zoom um, meeting last week to the community of But Would you, was that, you know, this is the way you do your due diligence for these like crypto uh, tokens or wallet, in this case, the wallet, that you, you dive deep into the in this case, it's a PDF. I'm looking at a PDF and the PDF shows like what the company is about. Well, I see it like a company because like, I trade stocks and you look at the who's the CEO basically or who's uh, who are the people involved with this. You do a little research on the people, just like I do research on like a CEO. Like I like to look at uh, CEOs like when I was short selling pump and dumps back a few years ago, I would look at in these, these uh, pump and dumps. A lot of them were in the OTCs and pink sheets. And the CEOs a lot of times had a lot of dirt on them. And you didn't know unless you looked deep into the into the company or who are the board members, who's this, you know, who's involved with this company. And sometimes like when the company members, they would have like felonies or some kind of weird stuff or like the company is located in a shed in a, in a you know, in Florida, in the Everglades somewhere. You know what I mean? Um, in the middle of nowhere, like you get these like... Um, red flags everywhere and that's how i was shorted but in this case so that's what you got to do with your due diligence you know you do you look for the red flags and also you look for the good things and in this case with your wallet justin saw a lot of positive um indicators of things that he was looking for that fit his uh criteria and he was looking to take it as a as a as a, as a long as a buy right so he mentioned that in the last episode and uh yeah you want to talk about that justin yeah, for sure. So um, just to touch base, basically, when you're looking and reviewing crypto assets, uh, we spoke briefly that we want to look for three things. First, we check for the fundamental analysis. So included in the fundamental analysis is, you know, what does the team 
do? Who is the team that created it? Um, what is the token about? What is the real world problem they're looking to solve? Um, and we check out their roadmap to see, you know, okay, if you're saying this is what you're going to solve and you're saying this is your team that is backing your word saying this is the problem you're going to solve, show me your roadmap and let me know, you know, when you're going to get closer to solving these problems. So that's the start of fundamental analysis. Um, anytime you're looking at a crypto asset, in my opinion, you want to only buy, especially only buy and hold crypto assets that have good fundamental analysis. So what we did is we pulled up here is this is called the Jiro Wallet Light Paper, um, L-I-T-E-P-A-P-E-R. So basically, crypto assets have went through a small rebranding when it comes to the original term, which was called white paper. Uh, a white paper is a very technical breakdown of how the team is going to go through the process of getting to their end result, which usually included a lot of like um, code jargon and different um, verbiage that the, the average investor might not understand. So now we see a lot of more, we see a lot more crypto assets coming out with something called a light paper, which in all essence, what it really is, is a pitch deck. So anybody that's familiar with pitch decks, um, that's pretty much what it is. So right now we have pulled up a PDF of Jira Wallet and their light paper. And uh, if you want, you can follow along at JiraWallet.io is where we found the light paper. And, you know, we'll have the link below for you as well. So the first thing we're doing when we're looking for fundamental analysis of Jira Wallet uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll talk about how it got on my radar, right? Yeah. So, uh, Jira Wallet, um, again, I, I do all this stuff from YouTube University and from Twitter. Um, I join Telegram groups, Discord groups, and really just have to have a conversation. With, with these emerging crypto assets, a lot of the investors have to base what they're going off on trust. Trust that the team is being honest and saying what they're going to do and they're going to actually accomplish Trust that the asset is not going to uh, rug pull, which um, we, we discussed about what rug pulls are. And, you know, trust that you're making the right decision. So going through, I joined the Telegram group for Jiro Wallet. I joined the Discord group for Jiro Wallet. And the first way they popped on my radar was watching a YouTube channel um, that was run <laughs> by uh, a gentleman named Crypto Man Ran. So you can follow Crypto Man Ran on Twitter. He's actually how I first um, got introduced to Jiro Wallet. So after I heard about it on his show, uh, I went ahead and did my own research, my due diligence, what we're, what David and I are doing right here, right now. And uh, I joined all the Telegram groups. I joined all the Discord groups. I started following them on Twitter. Um, and I just really dug deep. I had a conversation with the other people that were also in those groups. And that helped me get a better understanding of the project. So I'm going to read really briefly here, um, you know, what uh, the mission and vision of Jira Wallet is and you know what they're looking to, to complete. So it says, our mission is to create the ultimate Cardano wallet that boasts interchain and multi-chain compatibility while providing a superior user experience through an intuitive UI, user interface. We envision a wallet that empowers individuals to access decentralized finance, DeFi, technology, and a Swiss army knife of features by integrating with sister protocols and additional decentralized applications. Jiro Wallet will efficiently and reliably unlock the power of the Cardano network. So we spoke uh, briefly again what a native blockchain is, and Cardano would be considered a native blockchain. So um, I like to compare these two often, Cardano and Ethereum, because again, when we're talking about crypto assets, not every asset is used as a currency. So the Ethereum blockchain actually uh, has 83% of all tokens that are created. They're created on the Ethereum blockchain. So it's much more than just an asset that you would trade. It actually allows, there's a total of around 10,000 cryptocurrencies out right now. And again, 83% might be down to about 80% now of those are built on Ethereum. So Ethereum's competitor is Cardano. I'm a big believer in Cardano and Jiro Wallet will be launching on Cardano as their main wallet. So right there, we already have a few indicators that are going to let us know like, hey, this has you know a lot of potential. Cardano, also known as ADA, the ticker ADA. Cardano is currently, I believe, the fifth highest uh, market cap for all cryptocurrencies. So it's in, within the top five of all cryptocurrencies. Um, and it's just emerging. It just finished a protocol called the, I'm sorry, not a protocol, an update called the Alonzo update, which is going to allow smart contracts to be rolled out on the Cardano platform. And as we discussed before, smart contracts are the thing that actually enables the protocols to run smoothly and to um, basically be able to do what they're able to do. So um, 
Again, this is Jira Wallet being built on the Cardano network, and it'll be the first wallet built on the Cardano network. So they basically saw that the problem was that so many people want to interact with DeFi and so many people want to um, get into this space, but the user user experience is very difficult. Um, we were talking about barriers to entry when we were talking about needing $25,000 in your account to, to do day trading. Um, well, with, with crypto, there's you know usually a low barrier to entry, but what does pop up is the actual user interface and how they interact with the protocol. That is actually the barrier to entry. It's, it's difficult to understand how all this stuff works. So Jiro is trying to uh, resolve that by creating an all-in-one platform for all your crypto needs when it comes to transfers, when it comes to staking, when it comes to lending, when it comes to borrowing. Um, and these are all things that DeFi does. So Jiro is looking to solve all your DeFi needs in one source while also having an exchange. So basically Binance and Coinbase, they're called exchanges, while also having an exchange like Uniswap, which is a decentralized exchange, built into the wallet. So Jiro Wallet will allow for all DeFi to happen on it. It will allow for a decentralized exchange to happen on it. And it'll also, it'll also um, give the user, you know, expected, oh, I'm sorry, give the user more, what do I say, usability, mm-hmm. <laughs> more access to, uh, to DeFi products and, and lending protocols. So I'll read right here one more time. Uh, the adoption of blockchain introduced Web3 wallets and other DeFi products that provide alternative Alternative solutions to the current financial system. However, the steep learning curve results in a high barrier to entry, preventing a considerable amount of people from leveraging DeFi products. This is because users need to learn how to create a wallet, transfer crypto assets between wallets, stake and swap assets while using different applications. So, you know, that's exactly pretty much what I just showed David how to do earlier from our our previous episode. In addition, DeFi lacks general information for new users, creating a barrier to entry. The user is expected to overcome this information gap on their own while dealing with scattered resources and a lack of proper application documentation. This is one of the main reasons preventing mainstream DeFi application application and public consumption. So again, it's just hard to actually interact with these protocols because not a lot of people know how to do them. So so hold on a second. So like basically this is like a wallet kind of like you know, on the Apple phone, for they have like Apple Wallet. You put like all your your credit cards and stuff in there, and you just flash it uh, in the screen to check in the airplane or whatever. And also, the, so this is kind of like that. So all the stuff we did is kind of like all. It said, okay, um, it's scattered, scattered resources. So this is, it's so what we just did in episode two. It was kind of scattered, and that's what was kind of throwing me off from getting involved with with uh, crypto because um. I, I didn't know where to start. Okay, we got the MetaMask, we got the Binance, we got Coinbase, we got all this. And it's like, you got to do one by one, each one. Um, and the Jiro wallet is like, okay, it kind of like is a wallet to hold all, to put everything together a lot easier and it's able to... So, okay, yeah, am I on the right track here? Yeah, you're 100% exactly right. So, um, basically, you know, a lot of people are going to listen to the last episode and be like, damn, this sounds cool, but it sounds like a, like a lot of work. Like, holy shit. Yeah. Right? So Jiro- for me, it was like, I, like I, I'm in this business of markets and, and, uh, and I was like, man, it's too much, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, that's usually how, how most people feel. It's overwhelming, right? Yeah, you start yeah, yeah. out, it's like, where, who do I trust? How do I even know if this guy's legit? How do I know what he's saying is, is true? You know, what resources can I use? So Jiro Watt is looking to solve all that. So the first check mark for me was, that it is a Cardano project. Um, and in my opinion, Cardano is going to rival Ethereum. And and also, in my opinion, Ethereum is going to rival blockchain, um, blockchain Bitcoin as the number one crypto asset. So, you know, it's also in the top five, Cardano is. So that's a, another check mark. Um, and Jiro Wallet is looking to solve a real world problem where, just like you said, the barrier to entry is difficult because it's so challenging knowing where to go, what resources to use. Scattered so, resources. Exactly. And um, and also to, to add in there, this is mostly I'm approaching this, even though that everything sounds awesome. Um, this is mostly right now the main focus. I for for me, I'm taking this as most like a case study on how to do fundamental analysis first and foremost uh, with with uh, crypto. Because um, whenever I do fundamental analysis for stocks, it's it's uh, it's got the same concept, the same idea. Like you're digging you're digging into it. But with stocks, is it's more. I guess it's more regulated. You know, you have the SEC filings, and you have a uh, every time like an insider sells, they got to file within three days or whatever. You have S three forms. 
if they do an offering and then they got to they dilute the shareholders there's a lot you know, so there's a lot more regulation and like for example um over the counter stocks was kind of like crypto reminds me of over the counter OTCs or pink sheets because it's kind of like the wild wild west like pink sheets i think now they're trying to regulate um Pink sheets or OTCs that have like more SEC filings is a lot of people make a, made a ton of money, shit ton of money in January and December and all that off of like a couple of cent stocks, you know, and uh, millions of dollars like like crazy. And then now the they're trying to crack down on it. So in the future, you know, I think like all these shit coins and stuff. I was discussing it like with some people in Puerto Rico and all that. They might um they might regulate it a little more. Right? I don't know how or whatever, but there, it's just like all these shit coins are pumping dump schemes. It's more like a, like a giant casino and you have people losing their ass. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. Especially with the shit coins. Yeah. So, but, um, so the fundamental now, like off the first glance or second or third glance now, um, the fundamental analysis seems more for, for crypto, at least for a Giro and all that. It doesn't have it like regulated. It's just kind of like, it's giving you, it's presenting to you like, um, almost like a, how do you a say, pitch deck. a Google, yeah, like, um, a pitch deck or like, what do you call like a PowerPoint kind of thing and like laying out what it could be in the future, you know, or something like that. So how, so uh, off of that, Justin, so how do you know if someone is going to follow through on what they say? Cause it's like, this is like a politician promising a lot of things. And then he gets elected and doesn't deliver. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, so, I, I 100% agree. And, th- and that's the big issue, right? That's the big issue with crypto. It's like, I'm not putting my money into this. I don't even know, like, if this is really going to happen, what they say it is. Um, so, that's part of the fundamental analysis. So, the first thing we do, I guess I got ahead of myself, um, I guess, pitching Jiro, because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Jiro <laughs> fan. He's so, pumping it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, hey, guys, uh, to, to be transparent, I own Jiro. Uh, um, so, yeah, so to move away from Jiro in particular... What you want to look for is first again the real world problem it solves, right? So we found out what that was in Jiro, and you know they're going to be an all in one inclusive app to to handle your needs. So boom, that's the first thing. Find out what real world problem it solves. The next thing you want to do is find out who are the team, who are the creators of the of the asset that you're looking for, um, and then you just do your your general research that you would do as if you were looking up a CEO or a C you know a COO, whatever the case may be. A lot of times with crypto. They keep their team anonymous. And to me, that's an automatic red flag. If yeah. your team is anonymous, then, you know, what are you, what are you trying what are you to hide? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, they, use, they use a few different reasons uh, why they, they want to stay anonymous. But for me, uh, you know, I don't like that at can, all. can they fake it? They can put some fake photo there, right? You would never yeah, know, would you? Yeah, they could put a fake photo there. They could do, um, you, know, uh, you know, they could fake it however they wanted to fake it. Um, But at the same time, uh, a lot of times with crypto, when you join the Telegram groups, the Twitter groups, the Discord groups, and you're in that community of the asset, then they do what's called as an AMA, Ask Me Anything. Um, They'll do live chats and they'll they'll usually host. Like, that's how you know, right? That's how you get the feel of like, is this a shit coin and they're they're just throwing me some pipe Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is it like legitimate? So when we look at the team for Jiro, I was at first thrown off because they don't have their last name. So I couldn't do my full research. That. Yeah, I see that. And I was like, nah, hell no. So what I did is I went to the Telegram group. I looked up who the administrators were in the Telegram group and I just messaged every single one of them. And I was like, hey, like, you know, I really like your project. I want to invest in your project. But what's up with this? What's up with this? I asked three of them um, and all three got back to me and all three pretty much had the same response saying that, you know, it's going to be released very soon. Um, the full details of the team and, and whatnot. So uh, the fact that someone did get back to me, the fact that they do have a few um, AMAs coming up, it led me to believe that they're on the right track and maybe the their concerns about anonymity are, are legitimate. I see. So right now to uh, just to add to that, we're staring at a, uh a PDF right now with the team members and there's six, nine people that has like the profile faces and like their names and like their positions. So you're telling me in the telegram group, it has like their last name in it. No, no, that's what I'm saying in the tele that's, I went to the telegram group to message. I messaged uh Panos, uh, Costas, and I think it might've been Chris. Um, and I messaged all of them and I said, Hey, you know, what's up with this? Why, why aren't your names in here? Blah, blah, blah. And they just got back to me saying pretty much basic stuff. We're protect- protecting our anonymity. If people knew who we were, like they could, you know, be malicious actors and blah, blah, blah. Um, which is, which is true to, to an extent. So you kind of have to use your own judgment there. Now, I believe uh, a side note here is there's something called an I, um, 
an IDO, initial dex offering, and there's something called a launch pad. So Jiro was released on Card Starter's launch pad. So Card Starter is a launch pad for the Cardano network, and what a launch pad does is pretty much um, validate and audit the project to make sure that it's doing that the code says it's going to do what it says it's going to do, as well as the team is on track with their roadmap. And because Jiro was audited by card starters, that gave me way more like um, confidence in, in, in card investing. starters. Okay, so uh, what is card starters? Yeah, so card starters again is, is a launch pad. And so what a launch pad is, is it's a verification process that a crypto asset will go through before it actually launches onto the network that it's, it's plans on being deployed on. So for instance, Jiro is being gonna, going to be launched on the Cardano network. Mm-hmm. And card starters is a like validation system, authentication system to make sure that anything coming out on the Cardano network is legitimate and, and being worked on, you know, as to say they're going to. I see. So, so just card starters kind of like made this legit for you. Enough. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Card starters made it legit enough. And also like, um, you know, I'll reassess at the time if, if, the timeline continues to go down. And again, I'm inside of these communities. I'm chatting with people. I'm talking to other people. I'm raising concerns. So that way other community members can raise concerns and we can all get to the, the end goal, mm. right? So, um, you know, because I'm staying active inside of that community, it also gives me, you know, more of a relief. Like, hey, okay, these guys do have updates coming. They do say they are doing what they say they're going to do. So I see. So, um Cool. All right. So how did you find, I remember you pulled up like a LinkedIn of someone on this thing, right? Am I correct? Yeah. So that's what I started to do. I was trying to look at the LinkedIn for the team members, but they didn't have their last names. Yeah. And that's what originally made me jump through and start asking more questions in the mm. Telegram group and everything. And again, if this project did not come out on card starters, then I probably would have already kicked it to the side. But that's, I see. that's how strongly I feel about, um, you know, going through a, a launch pad. I see. I see. So it's like they're keeping up with their paperwork and their roadmap it, through yeah. car starters. So it's kind of like uh, an OTC company. So the OTCs, they don't, from what I know, they don't have to do filings. They don't have to report quarterly. But the ones that are kind of legit, they want to. Exactly. Uh, they want to you know, provide the value. They yeah, want to show yeah, you yeah. like, yo, what we're doing is is legit. We're changing the world. And we just have real life concerns about like, um, you know, for example, if they're if they building this team, a uh, couple malicious actors found out who it shows here in the paper that we're looking at, um, that Sean is the co-founder uh-huh. and it doesn't have his last name. But let's say, you know, they found who Sean was and then malicious actors tried to, you know, do whatever they wanted to that person. I got you. So, I mean, crypto in general is the wild, wild west still, you know, so it's it makes sense that they don't want to give their full name or whatever. I guess, you know, it's just it's crypto at, at this point. But I think in the future, they're going to something's going to have to. Yeah, something's going to give as far as with like the regulation and everything. Um, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. You know, I, I trust it up until I until I don't, right? Trust but verify. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. trusting, but I'm verifying all this information through the Telegram groups, through the Twitter groups, through um, looking everything up. So Yeah. Um, now, is it? do you see companies that do have their first and last thing? How common is this? This is, this is like one of the first, this is probably the second kind of thing I'm looking at like this, a PDF of like the fundamentals of a crypto token or wallet or whatever. Um, what's more common, like they, like a legit one, like, um, like Dogecoin, like how does Dogecoin fundamentals look if you were to have something like this of Dogecoin? Uh, so Dogecoin is this, is this sketch is, I guess what I'm trying to get at, you know, like when you look at this, does it sketch you out? Is there nothing there? Is just like some guy with his first name and it's some random photo? Um, <laughs> no, so Dogecoin has great marketing behind it, right? So, um, you know, they, they're doing it the right way when it comes to marketing and making themselves popular. But like even right now, like uh, I just pulled up the Dogecoin uh, website and there's no like white paper showing. It just shows how to get started. It shows you how to buy and how to sell. It doesn't show you who the team is. Um, really? So it has like nothing behind it. So, you know, also, I think I spoke we spoke off air about GitHub and GitHub is a website that developers use for peer to peer review. So when someone does an update to their network, they usually submit it for a peer review um, or at least for other people to see on GitHub, and that's called a commit. They're you know they're committing it to the for others to review. And Dogecoin hasn't. Well, I haven't checked in a while, but the last time I checked, Dogecoin hadn't had any commits done to their project in over like two or three years. So that shows no one is working actively on the project, and also no one can tell you who the developers are. Um, so at least like 
here we can see yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on the Jiro paper, we can see who some of the people are, regardless, like you said, they could be completely fake. But with Dogecoin, there's not even a team that, that's showing behind it. Um, you know, you can look up Dogecoin white papers and you'll get some news, like you'll be able to see a little bit about it. But once you read through the, the white paper, you'll realize that it doesn't quite solve the, the issues that it says it's going to solve. So, so like with, it, with stocks, uh, OTC stocks, this is like a, Dogecoin is like a shell company that their asset is only press releases. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, pretty much <laughs> like, yeah, there's pretty the much, there's price. not, it doesn't have a real world use case, right? It, yeah. It's not, it's not solving any real world problems. And as we just went over, Jira Wallet is, you know, going to solve a huge problem or is looking to solve a huge problem. Mm. So um, going back to just like, what do you look for in the fundamental analysis, right? First, we find out the real world problem is going to solve. We then look up the team, find out how legitimate the team are, see if it's on any, um, on any launch pads. So like, you know, Jiro is on the card starters launch pad, which helps give it a little bit more verification. Then you look into the roadmap to see how long the process is going to take and see if they're on track with their roadmap, if they're actually, you know, getting things done in the time they say they're going to get them done. And then the last thing, and also probably the most important thing is the tokenomics. Um, Understanding the token supply and the breakdown and whether it makes sense. So this is a great thing when it comes to Dogecoin for me to touch on. Bitcoin is a deflationary asset in the sense that only 21 million Bitcoin will ever be in supply. It has a limited capacity to only having 21 million ever be made, ever be minted. Um, as and when you and Doge, for this example, actually has a uh, unlimited supply, and they actually mint 10,000 per day. So I don't. It's hard for me to understand how you can invest into an asset. It's diluting constantly. That is, diluting by a, a massive amount every single day compared to investing into an asset that is only gaining in strength because less and less are being, you know, simple supply and demand laws, right? So gotcha. um, so tokenomics is a big thing to, to check out, which inside the tokenomics should include like your circulating supply. Um, it should include your total supply that's going to be out in the world. Um, it should also have a percentage breakdown of what the team is going to get, what the advisors are going to get, um, what the retail investors are going to get of the total total supply. So uh, going back to Jiro, the initial... Yeah, let's look at that with Jiro, all that you just mentioned. Yeah, so the initial circulating market cap um, for Jiro was 700000 and 300000 of the of that value was going to be locked into liquidity at launch. So, you know, okay, they're, overall, Jiro is going to plan to have $500 million Giros, which is fine, 500 million, that's understandable, but it's not all 5 million, 500 million coming out at once. They released 700,000, 300,000 for liquidity, and the other 400,000 to be d- divided up inside the tokenomics. Um, so to break down tokenomics further, we'll have to do another t- another episode to, to like really get into how they work, um, and we'll review. But uh, real briefly, before you move on, uh, we off the air, we spoke about the tokenomics, I guess, of Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, there's 21 million. Is it 21 million? Yep. And they, you know, they can't print anymore or whatever and all that. The, yeah. the, what you what you explain to me? Can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, so Bitcoin is considered a deflationary asset because there's only 21 million that will ever be minted in its lifetime. So currently, right now, if you can go on uh, the websites we mentioned, Coin Market Cap, or you can go on Coin Gecko, and you can see the total circulating supply of Bitcoin right now. So the Current circulating supply of Bitcoin is 18,740,850 Bitcoin. So there's a bar. I'm sorry. So, okay, there's 21 million that will ever be made. And currently right now, 18.7 million have been made. And that doesn't include losses or, um, you know, someone might get locked out, lose their seed phrase from their their Bitcoin. So there's... uh, there's many different things that can cause the coin to act. Someone could die and not give their, um, sorry, pass away, <laughs> and not give their, their seed phrase to someone else, which means no one can access it. Mm-hmm. So when you understand that only 21 million will ever be made and 18.7 have already been made, when the demand for Bitcoin grows, as we can see, like Bitcoin's adoption rate is at 80% per year since 2012. That's that's pretty nuts. Like 80% per year grows. Like that's mm-hmm. crazy. So if you know only 21 million are going to be made of something and 18.7 have already been made, 
then you realize the asset is going to increase in value as the demand increases in value because the supply is going down. Yes. Similar to that, uh, Ethereum is actually coming up with um, uh, something similar. They're going to start burning their tokens as well So to, to create a deflationary asset. So that way, um, I think it's called EI559. I have to look up uh, exactly what the term is for it, but... Um, once they start burning their tokens, the same similar effect will happen with Ethereum. Um, the supply will go down as demand is obviously increasing, which we all know will increase the value of the actual asset. So, um, so yeah, that's that's, that's really important. That's to understand. fascinating, man. Yeah, it's really fast. I found that so fascinating because I know, like, um, I I can understand it so easily because, like, with stocks, that's like the floats, and you got the market cap, and like the public flow as opposed to like, what insiders own and all this. But with uh, crypto, um. It's exactly what you just mentioned. Yeah, and um, even like more to the point, right? So Shibu Inu, we talked about like a shit coin. Yeah. If you look up their circulating supply, they have the highest circulating supply on coin market cap, and that is a circulating supply of three hundred and ninety four trillion. So what happens there? Like they just adding to it every day, or is it like that's just how it was uh, always? That that, that much? <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's part of the tokenomics. Yeah. So that's something you need to know before you invest in the project. Why would you invest in a project that has 394 trillion of them? How are we ever going to get an, like you know enough people yeah. using those to make it to make it as valuable as you know we? It's think it's, it wa- be? it's as watered down as you can get. I don't, I don't exactly. Know. So when people are saying like, "Oh, it's going to go to," a, a lot of people will buy these oh, and they'll own a million of them. And so I own a million Shibu Inu. I would rather own 0.001 Bitcoin than a million, two million, ten million Shibu Inu because when you think about it. The the price is not going to ever get to a dollar. And I hear a lot of people talking like on, on, on different YouTubes and Twitters like, yeah, well, just buy, you know, ten dollars worth. You never know. You do know because the, the circulating mark, the circulating supply is three hundred ninety four trillion compared to, let's say, Bitcoin circulating supply of twenty one million. Mm-hmm. You know, when you just think about those numbers, it, it really starts to come into sense. Um, and it works the same way on the opposite side. Like Yearn Finance is a good project with good fundamental backing, and they have a total supply of thirty six thousand six hundred and thirty five dollars. So Bitcoin has a total supply of twenty one million. Shibu Inu has a total supply of three hundred trillion, and this asset, Yearn Finance, has a circulating supply of thirty six thousand. So obviously, we know if the supply is low. And if demand increases on urine finance, the price is going to go through the roof. So urine finance's price is $31,435. And that's, again, because the total supply, the total amount anyone can buy is only $36,000. So the actual asset is valued very Mm. high because there's a limited supply of them. And that's what really helps drive up the value of an asset. Um, And when you're doing your fundamental analysis, if you skip this part and you don't realize that, that's a big deal. Yeah. Cool. Um, anything else on Giro before we move on to the next one? Um, uh, no. Uh, again, you know, Giro is a great project. You guys do your own research. Check it out. This is not financial advice. Um, but you know, just touching on what you need to look for. You would pull up an asset. You would check out their light paper if they have one, or their white paper. You would check out their mission and, and what real world so, problem. One second, Justin. So light paper, all these crypto things, they kind of have it. Light paper and white paper, they kind of like... Put- yeah, they should have one of the two. Every single asset should have a light paper or a white paper. And if they don't, then it's a it's a legitimate scam. So that's the term because, I, you know, in other asset classes, they don't... I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, it's crypto jargon. Um, yeah. You know, just like a, a K-12 report or I think that's what they're called for the the stock markets or like the um, annual reports annual, or whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah, so this is like their, you know, this will be their first report coming I out to, to the world. Okay. Uh, and w- okay. So, what do they need to get listed like on an exchange? They need to present this white paper and what was it? What, what else is it? White paper and yeah. So really, uh, whatever it is, they, they need to present it to the exchange and then they get listed on there. Like, how did Doge get into the Coinbase? So like, that's an exchange, right? Oh no, that's not an exchange. That's no, right. yeah, no, that's exactly yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and honestly, like, it it just depends on who the person is and what they have backing them. Um, like I pulled up a, a quick article here on Coin Telegraph, and um, it's supposed to describe how do crypto exchanges select coins and what do they look for. Um, but honestly, I don't I don't really believe it. Um, basically, I think that 
If the asset is starting to do well and it's gaining in popularity and the price is starting to gain, then the exchange has something to gain from it. If people want something, the exchange can sell it, charge a fee and make money. Mm -hmm. If we have a token that we're creating and we have enough money to push it to the exchange or we have a big backer, let's say, you know, this ex-COO of Google is on our team. He has a lot of connections. He Mark can Cuban. Talk to, yeah, Mark Cuban, whatever. They can talk to the, the people in the exchanges and get it listed. Uh -huh. So that's my personal opinion uh, on how um, crypto gets listed on exchanges. But um, for the actual, for what they say here in the article, I guess we can skim through it really quick. Uh, it says that the world's leading cryptocurrency exchanges need to be compliant with the United States. Okay. Um in the realm of digital finance, one of the biggest imaginable accomplishments is getting listed. And it says here that the vetted new tokens for their portfolios are often opaque. The criteria for Binance, it shows, is the digital a asset risk assessment framework. So they do a risk assessment framework and they also look up um, anti-money laundering. So that's what I'm saying. They're, everyone has their own obscure rules. Right. Like Coinbase might say, oh, we make sure that it's not risky. And Binance might say, oh, we make sure that it does this or that. Like, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't believe there's a real way to tell. Yeah. How other and we know how the world works. So, yeah, no, I see it in the stock market a lot. Like NASDAQ uh, and New York Stock Exchange are supposed to be two reputable ones. And New York Stock Exchange is the most reputable. When you see some sketchy companies, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm like, well, for forever. I'm like, how did this company even get listed? Like, I don't, I just trade it now, but it used to like confuse me uh, uh, when I was getting started. I was like, how did this weird company that's like in in another country file for this? And they were in, they're putting out a press release on crypto today. And next week they're putting out another one on NFT. And another week when the weeds are going hot, now they're a weed company. The same company is switching <laughs> to every hot sector. How the hell did this company get on the NYSE? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, and it's the same question that, you know, I asked. For, for crypto, um, I guess I can read here the the, the little bit that I did found. Um, qualif qualifications include the core team's strategic vision to solve some real world problem, the community's ability to organize in a way that aside, uh, that aids the project development, demand on the asset supply and demand, as well as techni technological feasibility and security. So, you know, that's that's up for interpretation. That's like, you know, yeah, yeah. anyone can say, oh, well, it's I, vague. Yeah, I yeah. think this I think that these things are happening or I don't think these things are happening. Like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So totally big. I got you. So um, and last question on this before we move on. So the light paper and the white paper is mostly for the investors just to get uh, information. It's not for the exchange. It's kind of they're putting it out there as a courtesy to show everybody, hey, we're doing this. We're doing our job. Exactly. Right. It's It's the initial sales pitch to the world. Like, hey, this is our roadmap. This is what we plan on doing. Mm. This is how we're going to do it. This is our team. This is, These are our tokenomics, which, again, extremely important. Google tokenomics, look those up. And they'll and then, then they put out their white paper uh, or light paper in that form because usually those things broken down in that nice, clean, you know, um, edited way for you is the light paper. And when you're reading something and you can't understand the terms and you're like, what, what the hell is this? That's a white paper. So white paper is usually for the more technical developer type sides. Light paper is usually for the more retail investors that want to know about it. But again, they don't know how to do the, the deep dive. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. So let's, um, let's move on to the other one. Uh, other example here, the other case study we got, um, the TRVL token. Yeah, so um, TRVL hasn't actually released yet. So this is something that anyone listening can kind of get on early. Um, the company's name, and again, same thing, crypto asset company. Uh, the the asset's name is D-Travel. So D-T-R-A-V-E-L, D-Travel. And what D-Travel is looking to do is they're pretty much looking to become a decentralized version of Airbnb. So um, again, we talked about DAOs, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and a DAO pretty much allows the platform to run itself. It's decentralized, meaning um, there's no one uh, authoritative power that can turn on and off the light switch. It's autonomous, meaning it's running itself. The code is just providing the code, providing the code. Um, sometimes it uses uh, AI integrations to get you know similar feedback, and then it can just loop and, and answer quickly. So it runs itself. Um, so a DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. So D-Travel is a DAO, so it runs itself which, you know, first of all, is really cool. 
It's looking to solve the real world problem of uh, Airbnb and the fees of Airbnb and um, just hosting people in general. It saw the, the, the niche market of how popular it's becoming to just, hey, here's my car. I'm not using it. You use it. You know, hey, here's my house. I'm not using it. You use it. Hey, here's my office. I'm not using it. You use it. And, and it's understanding that that's becoming more and more popular. Um, but just like with anything in crypto, it's cutting out the middleman, right? So just like we talked about DeFi, DeFi is cutting out the middleman, the banks. So how you want to get a loan and you want to borrow against your loan, DeFi allows you to do that directly with each other. You work with the platform and that's it. There's not a, there's no um, author, uh, authoritative power that cuts off, you know, the light switch there. So similar to um, to that example with DeFi, uh, D-Travel is doing the same thing and you're going to be able to pretty much like host people and um, sell your sell your location on D-Travel instead of Airbnb. And I just looked up a quick example here. Like if you were making $40,000 a month in bookings from Airbnb, you would be charged about $8,000 of that just to go to Airbnb compared to if you're doing $40,000 a month on D-Travel, you would only be charged about $3,000. So normally it's about 20% that Airbnb takes out um, and D-Travel only takes out 7.5%. So that's uh, obviously, you know, if they can get enough people onto their platform and using their platform, it, obviously it'll be way cheaper. It'll be cutting out the middleman. And how that's going to work is they're going to use the token TRVL to interact on their platform. So say that I wanted to host someone with my Airbnb. Um, I'm using the D-Travel platform. Um, someone decides that they want to book with me. They could send me Bitcoin, Ethereum, or they could send me the TRVL token. And, and that's how they would book their location. Another cool thing about um, D-Travel, because it's a DAO, it offers something called a governance token. And a governance token basically allows you to vote on changes that would happen to the application. Hmm. So let's say that um, we find out after using D-Travel for two years that it's going pretty well, but we want to change, we as in the people that use it, we want to change something about D-Travel. We're like, hey, this is great, but this one thing just really annoys us and, and it could be better. We would all, anyone could submit it. Anyone could submit a change to the, the um, protocol. And then you use your governance token, your TRVL, to vote on the protocol. If you don't have any TRVL, then you can't vote on the protocol. So that's called a governance token and govern, governance system. Um, and that's a, you know, another really cool thing about D-Travel. So it's like having shares in a company to vote. Yeah. Kinda. Exactly. So, but, and how do people get the TRVL token instead of like, so you can pay with TRVL token and you can also pay with whatever Ethereum and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but how do you, how would people get that TRVL token as opposed to the other ones? Is TRVL worth more? So, you know, the value of any token is just what you say it is or what your community says it is. Like I have my But Would You community and let's say I create the, you know, BWY, But Would You, uh, let's say I create the BWY token and I use it now in my community community as governance. And now, first, let's say my community is only using it to vote on certain things. But then let's say, um, you know, they're saying there's value there. So they start pegging a value to the, to the token. More and more people that put their money in to buy the token, you know, that's a pool of money that I'm collecting. So that pool of money divided by however many tokens are in the circulating supply would give me like my market cap. I see. And but the TRVL token would be the voting rights. Well, it, it would work as both. It would work as an asset. That's why not all cryptocurrencies, not all crypto assets are only cryptocurrencies. So the TRV, the TRVL token would not only act as a governance token for voting rights, but it would end up creating, you know, its own value inside that community, see. which eventually could be used to trade. Like we could use um, Uniswap and trade TRVL for Jiro. Mm. And, you know, so the, the value of TRVL would be based off its governance and its community and how many people are starting to use the platform. Let's say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a, a shit ton of people just joined the platform. They raise their market cap up to like, you know, $3 billion or something. Then the total supply divided by the market cap would be the price. So they're giving away like 35 million TRVL tokens. Yeah. So there's something called an airdrop in crypto. And pretty much it, uh, it rewards the people that use the use the token from the beginning. And it also helps create the value of the token. So there, so TRVL, um, they're going to airdrop 35 million tokens to the first 1,000 properties that register and are verified uh, to bootstrap the network. So, so that's like uh, when Bitcoin first started. The guy bought pizza with 10,000 Bitcoin. 
Yeah, so um, you have to you have to find a price. You have to find a market price for an asset, right? So when Bitcoin was first coming out, they were trying to find the only people that had Bitcoin were the miners and the creators. So it was a small community of people. Let's say only ten people had Bitcoin. So that Bitcoin didn't, you know, to me and you at that time, it wasn't worth shit. Like I don't want your ten thousand Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. What the hell? But as time went on, um, a guy named Laszlo bought ten thousand. Uh, ten thousand. I'm sorry. He bought two pizzas with ten thousand Bitcoin. And the way he did this was he went on a, a forum like Reddit or you know Twitter, whatever it was, and he said, "Hi, I'm looking to offer ten thousand bitcoins for two pizzas." And then he described how it would work. He said, "You would call the pizza shop, you would give them your debit card, and you would pay for the pizzas um, and have them delivered to my address. In return, I'll send you ten thousand bitcoin." And that's actually how the first bitcoin found its its fair market value. So they're trying to do something like that here by giving out those thirty five million. Yeah, so so every crypto asset is pretty much doing you know, tries to do something similar to that to find the the real market value of the asset and then you can build off of that. So let's say at that time, you know, um, let's say two large pizzas cost forty dollars. So ten thousand divided by forty or forty divided by ten thousand, whatever it works out to, gave you the price of what uh, Bitcoin yeah, was worth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you have a peg, now you have something to go off of. Now you can say, Hey, you know, this guy just literally created the value of Bitcoin out of Satoshi Nakamoto out of not thin air, but he found, you know, a price someone was willing to pay and that created a market value for it. I see. Um, okay, so with TRVL with this thirty five million, how many are there in, in uh, how many tokens are there in total? Uh, so we would have to look up the tokenomics in regards to that, um, and I don't. I'm not sure if they've released their tokenomics yet. I'm looking through their site here. But they're saying 35 million to to be given to the first 100 thousand properties that registered and verified to bootstrap the network. So basically, if you want to give this a shot, you can list it, your Airbnb basically with this. Yeah, so and start and get some tokens. Exactly, right? So you can use their network and you, and nothing might ever come of it. But if you list onto their network and you become a host, when you're on the D Travel website, it says, um, oh, become a host. And uh, why host? And it gives you more information about becoming a host. But, you know, the host benefits would be lower fees. You have direct communication with the people that are staying there. There's uh, multiple payment options. They offer peace of mind with uh, $1 million in damage protection, liability insurance. Um and you can align your interest with like the people that are coming to stay there. So I see. You know, it's like again, it's cutting out the middleman. It's directly interacting with me and you, and it's allowing us to um, to interact that way because it's a DAO. It's running itself, and it has governance tokens that we can pay for. But let's say you know I don't really value the TRVL token as much. I say I don't want that. Send me Bitcoin instead. Send me Ethereum instead. I see. Yeah, yeah. But also just by hosting for right now, anyway, the first one hundred thousand people that host. Are going to get um, thirty five million TRVL, you know, divided up amongst them. So, so, so right now, if I list a whole bunch of stuff on Airbnb, let's say I got an apartment or whatever, a couple apartments, and I list and I and they give me, I don't know, ten thousand, a hundred thousand TRVL tokens. So when it comes out, IDO is that what you call it? I can just dump it on. Uh, I could just sell it off, dump it, and then uh, I, I, you know, I make a shit ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it depends, right? You, it, that that also comes into the tokenomics. That's why tokenomics are so important because uh, usually when the the IDO comes out, um, let's say going back to Jiro's tokenomics, right? They have uh, they're vested, so the private sale makes up of thirty six percent of the total tokens vested for twelve months, and then the team developers receive twenty percent of the total token supply vested for twenty four months. So it just depends on the tokenomics, and that's uh -huh. where you really find out if you're going to get screwed or if it's a scam, or you can, you know, you mm -hmm. start getting an inclination of what the project's really doing with, when see. you understand the tokenomics. So this is just one token that hasn't come out yet. TRVL, is, it, it looks pretty cool. Um, so just in general, like daily, are there like a ton of these really cool tokens floating around that haven't come out yet? Yeah, so and you just have to weed them out. You just have to go through them and dig in a little exactly, bit. Exactly, just like stocks, right? There's you know x amount of stocks in the world, and you go through all of them to find the shittiest one, so then you can go short it, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's the, the same Chinese thing. ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing. Like if you go into CoinMarketCap.com, there's a, at the top there's a bar that shows there's currently ten thousand five hundred seventy different cryptocurrencies, um, and once you know that. Then you can go through, find the ones that are good, find the ones that are bad, do the fundamental analysis. Uh -huh. Then you have your like your wish list. 
And then once you have your wish list, you can deep dive. You can find out who's in the team and, you know, took notch and, and all that. So, um, so for TRVL and GERO, and the reason why I'm, I keep pointing, because you pointed out really good, uh, like breakdown of it in the web, in the webinars, I'll call it on Zoom and, uh, explaining it to like a group of people that are learning. You know, I think it was, it was really clear to understand, like, TRVL, you can relate it to Airbnb, Giro Wallet, you can cre- relate because like it's solving a lot of problems. Now, how many of uh, tokens and wallets or whatever did you have to go through to find those two right there? Like, uh, to, to, you know, to weed out a bunch of ones that are just like yeah. garbage. Uh, so pretty much what I do is um, I go to CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap and you can look up all the tokens. And then first, I just kind of look at what stands out and what makes sense. Right. So I'll just pull up the circulating supply. Like, and right off the bat, I can exit out, you know, how... Oh, my... Buzzer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, Two-minute warning. <laughs> and right off, the, right off the bat, I can, you know, cut out X amount of tokens because I'm like, no, this doesn't make sense. Oh, your circulating supply is 300 trillion. That doesn't make sense. Um, you know, whatever the case may be. So, usually I'll go through maybe, let's say, you look for an hour, two hours, and, you know, you can cut off 50% in... in Thirty seconds, you know, to well. Now that I've gotten better at it, like I can cut off thirty percent in let's say a minute. Mm-hmm. So you know, so half the time I'm I'm cutting out. The other half of the time I'm like making a list of them. And then once I have my list, I can kind of take my time with it. I can go through. I can read the tokenomics. I can read the white paper. I can do the research on the team, and I can really find out, you know, is it worth it? And then you still, it's still a risk, right? It's still because these companies, that's what they are. They're companies. Yeah. Um, they're trying to blow up. They're trying to become a. a a strong player in the game, right? So they're going to tell you whatever they want to tell you to get to that to get to that point. Now, does the CEO ever come out and like say a quote, like in stocks? Like that's a, that's one thing that moves stocks. When the CEO comes out, instead of of course they're going to say something positive, they never say anything negative. Yeah. But do they? Does this like what, those guys that we were looking at right now? Do, does any one of them actually ever come out and have like a someone quote them on a paper or press release or anything? Um, not usually. Um, I mean, you you will have it here and there. Usually the people with influence, you know, the Elon Musk, the Mark Cubans, like those type of uh, Kevin Leary. Uh, I don't know. The Kevin Leary just came out with an interview when he um, had an interview with Anthony Pompliano, who's a big Bitcoin uh, yeah. enthusiast. And um, he was pretty much saying, like, why would you ever go back to fiat? Fiat is terrible. You know, you need to be investing in DeFi and you need to be investing in crypto. So you'll have people like that, right, that, that probably it. have an interest in it. And they probably own a couple of these that we don't know about. Um, but... To my knowledge, you know, it's not too often where so, it's just... So Kevin direct. Leary is a whale. Super whale, yeah. Super whale. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, and that's the thing, right? So right now we're still so early in crypto. All these big hedge fund institutional guys that have billions of dollars, they're learning right now. They're taking the time to learn about this shit. And like me right now, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, you whale. You're, you're No, I'm not whale. a whale, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just like just like you, man, they're, they're taking the time to learn this stuff. But the difference is that they have a team of people that can like learn it for them pretty much. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do this. Yeah, don't. So when they come into the market, that's what. That's when the price is going to yeah. just go stupid. And, and Bitcoin, in my opinion,'s market cap will, will eclipse gold's market cap. And gold's market cap is $10 trillion, So... You know, you can find out the future price of Bitcoin by taking their total supply, 21 million, divided by their market cap, 10 trillion, and, and then that will give you the price. Um, yeah. You know, and you guys can do that at home and, and tell me if you want to invest in Bitcoin. So Crazy. So last little thing here before we wrap it up. Okay, so when you were getting GRO when it was IDO and you didn't know about the gas and all that, that's basically T, uh, TRVL is about to do that, what GRO did when it went public. Yeah, so um, so you need to get you need to be prepared with the gas and all that stuff that you were mentioning for yeah, TRVL. Yeah, so different um, different tokens release in different ways. There was a uh, something called like um, uh, ICO was first the initial coin offering, then IDO initial dex offering, um, ISO initial staking offering. So there's different ways that a, a token can release. Um, but once they once they announce that, so this is the part where you know for for our fundamental analysis of D travel. This is where we would read this white paper. We would take the key highlights. We would take the team and we would take the tokenomics. We would do all our homework on that part. And then we would find out where they're releasing what, and they haven't released their tokenomics yet. But once we know that stuff, then we can determine, you know, where we're going to buy it, how we're going to buy it, whatever. I the see. I see. Then you plan for it. But usually they don't come out on centralized exchanges. Like almost no token will initially list on there. So that way, if you do know how to use a DEX like Uniswap and you know about the gas fees and everything, you can get into a project well before it ever gets listed. 
So, that, like, Shibu Inu. Like, you yeah. had to get in, like, again, that's a shit coin. I don't suggest getting into it, but you had to buy that first on a decentralized exchange. And then once it got listed on Coinbase, you're like, if you're a holder of it, you're hype. You're like, oh, shit, this should give us a nice little pop. You know what I mean? It's, it's Now it has a wider audience to reach, and the barrier to entry to buy it is way less than the barrier entry that you went through. And that's kind of your reward for going through that barrier, right? You, mm. Like, I got into Jira Wallet at a super early stage before it does get released. Now Cardano is about to release its um, Gogan phase with their smart contracts. And once that comes out, I'm hoping that, you know, it'll start picking up more and more. The bars start rolling. And then people start FOMOing into it when they hear about it. And now, you know, I was buying it at 11 cents and it goes up to a dollar or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well... That sums up today. Uh, this is three parts we did today. That was a lot of work, man. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, that, was, man. That, was, it was cool. that was dope. It was tight. It was tight. And yeah. uh, hopefully we'll be back with more, too. So Absolutely. Yeah, I learned a ton. Uh, now it's documented here on, on the podcast. Anyone can listen to it. Um, but yeah, you can check out Justin's stuff. Uh, we're going to make it in the show notes. We have But Would You Twitter, But Would You um, Instagram, um, everything. Maybe he does a podcast in the future too. <laughs> yeah, so. I would love to like start uh, getting deeper into the podcast game. So maybe I'll start yeah, taking some yeah, notes. Yeah, for sure. You. But yeah, um, and uh, before I leave back to Puerto Rico, um, soon probably have uh Justin back for an, an, one more episode or something like that. But that being said, yeah, um, I'll catch you guys later. Thank you for listening. Peace out. That concludes today's episode. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel on the platform you use. The Friendly Bear Podcast is hosted by me, David, or you can find me on Twitter at reverse underscore long. You can find The Friendly Bear Podcast at www.thefriendlybearpodcast.com, as well as on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Audible, Amazon Music, and more. Until next time, thank you for listening to The Friendly Bear Podcast.